Hello and welcome. I'm Anna Danziger Halperin, Associate Director of the Center for Women's History here at the New York Historical Society. Before we begin this afternoon's program, I would like to thank Louise Muir, our President and CEO, Agnes Shu Tang, Chair of the Board of Trustees, and Pam Schaffler, our Chair Emerita, as well as all of our trustees, Joyce B. Cowan, Jean Margot Reed, Diane Max and the late Adam Max, the Mellon Foundation, our Chairman's Council, our members, and our many other generous donors. None of the work of New York Historical would be possible without your continued and committed support. As the Associate Director of our Center for Women's History, I'm proud of the growth we've achieved here at the Center since opening only a few short years ago. Our scholarship, education, programs, collecting, and least of all, not least of all, our exhibitions, all foreground women's critical role in American history. This afternoon's program, Survival Through Faith, Women and Community Care, is part of our 2023 Diane and Adam E. Max Conference on Women's History. The conference, which was the brainchild of Diane Max and her late husband, Adam, was established in 2016, before the bricks and mortar of our center were even set. We are so grateful to the Maxes for their imagination and the impetus to set this cornerstone of our work. Our conference theme this year is Keeping the Faith, Sex, Gender, and Religion. When we look at the divisions fracturing society today, many of us point to organized religion as a restrictive force regulating and limiting gender roles. Yet, faith-based communities have also provided avenues for women and LGBTQ plus individuals to pursue leadership opportunities and to push for broader gender equality from within their traditions, complicating any simple view of religion and partisanship. When we thought about how to organize the various panels of this conference, we contemplated the different ways that individuals have shaped and transformed not only their faith, but also the religious lives of their communities throughout our nation's history. If you've missed any of the previous panels in our conference, we invite you to go to our website to view recordings of them. To those watching this post-conference, thank you so much for taking the time to join us as we contemplate this year's important topic. Our program today will run for approximately 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A. At any time during our program, please submit your questions through the Q&A feature located on your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we can following the discussion. And now I'm delighted to introduce our panel. Hasia Diner is Professor Emerita at New York University in the Departments of Hebrew History and Hebrew and Judaic Studies. She has written extensively in both American women's history and American Jewish history, and as a former Guggenheim winner, and lucky for us at the center, she's also part of our scholarly advisory board. Karma Lekshe Somo earned a PhD in comparative philosophy at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, where she's currently the 2023 Numata Professor of Buddhist Studies. Her publications include Women in Buddhist Traditions, Buddhist Feminisms and Femininities, and Into the Jars of Yama, Buddhism, Bioethics, and Death. Renja J. Child is Northrop Professor and former Chair of the Departments of American Studies and American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota. She's author of several books in American Indian history, including Boarding School Seasons, American Indian Families, 1900 to 1940, which won the North American Indian Prose Award. She's a member of the board of the Minnesota Museum of American Art. She was born on the Red Lake Ojibwe Reservation in Northern Minnesota, where she's part of a committee developing a new constitution for the nation. Our moderator, Serene Jones, is the 16th president of the historic Uni Theological Seminary in the city of New York. The first woman to head the 186 year old institution, Jones occupies the Johnston Family Chair for Religion and Democracy. She's the author of several books, including Trauma and Grace, and most recently her memoir, Call It Grace, Finding Meaning in a Fractured World. We are so delighted to have all of you with us this afternoon, and I'll now turn the conversation over to Serene to get things started. Great, Anna, thank you so much for the introductions and thank you for setting up this panel for framing uh, the purpose of the panel for us and bringing this conversation into a public space. It's its so important. And I want to say thank you for that. Um, so I have the wonderful task of moderating our conversation, which in my mind means I get us started. And um, from what I know of our panelists, 
we will have no difficulty jumping in and um, talking about the issues and the questions. So I wanted to start um, with a seemingly simple question, but one that I think will begin to open up the space mm -hmm. of conversation in more complex ways. Um, the, the work of care in our communities, um, survival and care, is one of the framing issues for us. Now, um, as uh, women who um, both work as scholars of religion and um, also occupy spaces of leadership within religious tradition, so um, we come at it from very different perspectives, I wonder if you could say, based on where you stand as a scholar or as a faith leader or both, um, when you hear the word care, how does the tradition define it? And then secondly, do women have any distinctive relationship to the work of what we're calling care today? Um, and I wonder, Brenda, maybe if you would um, launch us into the conversation. Yes, thanks so much. I think that's a really beautiful question. And <clears throat> I feel like somewhat of an interloper on the panel because I am an American Indian historian, and I certainly don't consider myself a scholar of religion. But as it turns out, I have been very interested for several years in a spiritual tradition uh, that is um, very prominent among Ojibwe people of the Great Lakes. And I'm Ojibwe from uh, Northern Minnesota, one of the largest tribal groups in the US and Canada. And um, this was a tradition I learned about actually from my grandmother and it's called the jingle dress dance tradition. And so when I think of that word care, I guess I kind of turn it over in my mind a little bit and I use the word healing because that's the word that we so often use in our communities, um, native people in general of the US and Canada, but certainly uh, where I'm from. And so it's interesting to me that one of the big spiritual traditions today associated with women is something performed at powwows, which we don't generally think of as um, kind of religious events, but rather social events. But one part of the powwow that is very interesting is this um, tradition that began with Ojibwe women a century ago, and in more recent decades has spread out among North American Indian people more broadly. And so that is, you know, at a powwow, when you see the jingle dress dance performed, if you've ever been to a powwow in the US and Canada, you've seen it or you will see it. And it's um, a dress where women have these very interesting uh, kind of uh, little metal cones that adorn their dress. And for Ojibwe people, we think of spiritual power as moving through air. And so the sound of healing is very important to us. And so when I think of care, like I said, I, I kind of automatically think of this word healing, uh, which is so important to Ojibwe women in the part of the world where I'm from. I may, if we move along, I don't wanna seem obsessed with this particular topic of the jingle dress, but I may raise it again uh, because it specifically has a history rooted in the last global pandemic a century ago. Oh, good. We'll come. We'll come back to that um, in just a minute. Um, um, Lekshay. Yes. Um. So happy to be here with all of you today. Um. Although I'm seated here on the Hawaiian lands, um, on Oahu, I would like to focus on my work in the Indian Himalayas and the women there who have helped to preserve Buddhist traditions for centuries. So in the Buddhist perspective, the concept of care would be framed as loving kindness and compassion, which are two of the, the central virtues, central practices of Buddhist traditions around the world. So women in particular, I think women in, in all cultures have a special role in caregiving. They are sort of typecast as, as the kind and loving caregivers of all, uh, but it's actually 
sort of um, immortalized in in the Buddhist tradition that women are especially um, skilled at caregiving um, and compassion. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama often says you can tell this when a baby reaches out, a newborn reaches out to its mother with love. And that women from the very beginning are the models of loving kindness and compassion. So um, of course this is a stereotype and yet in a sense you can say that we are trained to be caregivers from a young age. And in Buddhist traditions, this is definitely the case. Uh, behind the scenes, you may see the men on the microphone, but behind the scenes, women are doing all the work <laughs> to make sure that everyone is happy and nourished and, and uh, comfortable. And um, so this more and more in the present era is coming to light. Before it's sort of been overlooked. But today, women are more and more taking center stage and making it very visible, the roles in loving kindness and compassion that they have been doing all along. And now they are being increasingly recognized for the important roles that they play. So this is what I'd like to highlight and appreciate. Mm -hmm. Loving kindness and oh, thank you. Um, 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 Hasia, would you like to jump in here? Um, sure, thank you. And please, whoever's watching, forgive. There's something wrong with my camera, and I am so not competent to uh, uh, fix it myself. Um, so please accept my uh, dis literally disembodied uh, voice in this conversation. So um, I'm a scholar of American Jewish history, and uh, which inevitably makes me a scholar of American Judaism as kind of religious practice. And uh, in a way, the two questions which motivate my work, and I think most of my colleagues, is both the transplantation of uh, Judaism to uh, North America, to the United States, and how American conditions rendered it uh, kind of open for renegotiation and for, divert, for change. Uh, and uh, how those American conditions made what had been uh, uh, unable to remain stable. And secondly, uh, partly also because of American conditions, the ways in which America, the American Judaism, and particularly the role, and specifically the role of Jewish women, paralleled and drew from the experiences of women in other religious tradition, particularly Protestantism, but not only. And uh, that living in America, which from the Jewish perspective was an incredibly open society. Um, they saw, they learned, they uh, understood what would work for them uh, in this new environment. So specifically on women and care, we might say that the tradition itself inherently had uh, an idea that uh, obviously care was personal, care was familial, care was the immediate community, uh, and care was a kind of global community. And women had roles always in all four of those runs, but for the most part, it was gender segregated. Segregated Men obviously had power, men had all the visible communal roles, but women had their niche for care of self, care of family, care of a uh, larger community, and uh, for that um, global uh, Jewish diaspora. Uh, and um, so women did for women, men did for men. And let me just give one example because I'm influenced now by Brenda's presentation about using one example. So traditionally um, in issues of sickness and death, men took care of men, it was the Fevri Kedisha. And then there was the Chevrat Nashim, the women's uh, uh, sacred society. And they sat with a woman who was um, ill or in labor. Uh, if a woman died, they prepared the woman's body for burial. They sewed the shroud. They sat with the body, uh, recited psalms until the uh, until internment. Okay, men didn't do that for women. <laughs> women didn't do that for men. What becomes really significant in the United States is that those women's societies so deeply rooted in millennia of um, uh, ritual practice became major centers of power for women 
in one local community after another. So the Women's Society, and they were often called the Women, the Female Hebrew Benevolent Association, which sounds really Protestant, but when you look at their minutes, they were sewing shrouds and they were collecting uh, uh, money to get trousseaus for uh, indigent brides and helping women set up businesses. And they sat with the sick and they sat and they prepared uh, tapara for purification of a body for burial. Uh, but they became, they learned from the Protestant women in, I don't know, Omaha, Akron, Martinsburg. And they saw the Protestant women had these organizations and they use them for enhancing power. And so the Jew, these female Hebrew benevolent associations raised lots and lots of monies with money with uh, cake and coffee socials and ice cream parties and da da da. And they amassed these treasuries. And then the men, the men's synagogue, because the women couldn't belong, would turn to the female Hebrew benevolent association and say, well, we need your money to build a synagogue. And then I would say, no, we collected it. It's for our purposes. Now, if you ask, maybe we'll give you some. So, uh, and you know, eventually they do um, uh, uh, fork over some of the money. They always insist on having a voice in what that building is gonna look like, where it's gonna be located. And in a way, in an institution in which they had no power, they used what was essentially their traditional care role to enhance their visibility in the community and to make themselves heard in a context where they had no voice otherwise. Well, th thank you. Um, that These very specific examples are actually quite interesting. And it, in all of the responses, um, I hear this sort of um, paradoxical tension in that on the one hand, um, we know looking actually across traditions that uh, globally um, women make up the vast majority of the actual practitioners of religions um, in communities. Um, and uh, in large part, women's roles are focused on the work of care, not exclusively, um, and different ways of understanding it from the healing of the jingle dress to um, loving kindness uh, to the work of uh, labor, illness, and death. Um, so, but, but it is the it is the labor of the care of bodies in communities that makes sort of our physical and emotional and mental lives possible. Um, but that's also uh, that division of labor is built on whole bunch of assumptions about this is what men do and this is what women do, uh, a gender binary. Um, uh, so I just want to put that out there. I mean, we're all aware of that as people who work on this topic particularly, but I want to bring us to um, a very uh, close to home recent um, reality, and that is uh, the pandemic COVID-19 where the work of care was on overdrive um, in every community globally. Um, and I'd like for us to talk about how the work of care of women played itself out in that. And then just touch on this issue of, do it was that a context where we began to see any um, sort of challenges to this traditional division between the work of care and the work of what's often referred to as the public sphere, the, the work of traditional labor. Um, so um, Brenda, you brought this up right off the bat. So yeah. I'm going to start with you again. Sorry to start with you twice, but you, That's this fine. Is you're you. working on. So start. Yeah, it it's, it's kind of funny because right before the, <clears throat> before the pandemic, began, I had just opened a small exhibit up in uh, a tribal museum on the Mille Lacs Reservation in Minnesota about the history of the jingle dress dance tradition, because I realized here it is 2018, 2019, uh, you know, that it's the hundredth anniversary. So I was so proud of myself to get this together with my student, the exhibit opened. We had historic dresses through the decades. 
And then the museum closed down because of another global pandemic. So it's so I don't know if I brought it on or if I'm to blame, but <laughs> it was um, really an interesting moment for me as a scholar because I was getting calls from the CBC in Canada and people in New York and and hear this small little tradition out of the Great Lakes that I learned about from my grandmother because she was a jingle dress dancer suddenly became of wider interest to people because of what we were facing um, at that time. And when I talk about the jingle dress, it's always sad to not have a visual image uh, for you. Uh, but, um, and I usually have all my slides and all my pictures and so forth, but I want to encourage all of you uh, New Yorkers to go to the Met in the next couple of months because we have a small exhibit on the jingle dress with a historic dress from Minnesota and a contemporary dress, you know, so a dress from a century ago and a dress um, from more recent times that uh, was made by a fabulous jingle dress maker up in Thunder Bay, Ontario. So you'd be able to kind of go over right now and see this. And I have a fantastic former student from the University of Minnesota, Patricia Morakin Norby, who's the first curator of indigenous art at the Met. And so we had a big program about the jingle dress at the Met in November. And it was so great to get together in public, have a big event. We brought jingle dress dancers out from the Great Lakes. And it was kind of our way of recognizing that history in a global pandemic a century ago. But now look at everything that we had, we had been through. And it was so thrilling, I think, for many of us to just be able to gather together again. And, um, and for us from the Great Lakes to kind of bring this tradition uh, to a broader audience has been really um, something we've appreciated. I know when you mentioned that um, kind of the gender binary, and I guess the only thing I would have to say about this that's maybe a very nice thing, and it maybe it gets us into that area of healing again, uh, which I use rather than, than care, I think, is that um, one of the fantastic things about um, the jingle dress dance tradition, even though women perform the the dance at powwows, which is widely regarded as a tradition of healing. Um, the healing can be for an individual, it can be for the well being of your community. And a century ago, it was related to the young people who had died in that pandemic. Because if you recall, it was a different, somewhat different virus and circumstances surrounding that pandemic, in that more young people died than older people is was the case with this. So much is, must have been a, a horrifying thing for people uh, who lived through it. But as far as the gender binary, one of the things that, that I really like is that in our Ojibwe communities of the Great Lakes, men are deeply invested in the jingle dress dance tradition. They compose the songs, they sing, they drum, you know, they are just as active in um, continuing this tradition of a century ago as are women, although women have that kind of beautiful performative role of getting up and dancing the jingle dress dance, which is fantastic when you see dozens and dozens and dozens of women dancing together. And it sounds beautiful too. Hmm. Oh, that is beautiful. Um, and, and just a follow-up question, um, having studied it, um, in the uh, the previous pandemic and then being in the middle of it uh, with this pandemic, did you see any sort of mutations, evolutions, changes um, over time uh, with this ritual that uh, yeah. over your dear period? Um, I guess I would say, and this has to do with um, why I wanted to kind of show the dress um, through the decades, the historic dresses is, I wanted kind of the, the Ojibwe, you know, as a historian, it was fantastic for me to finally figure out this came out of the last pandemic. And there are several reasons why I, I kind of ultimately concluded. And for Ojibwe people, they're not, there's a story associated with the jingle dress of a little girl who is very ear, ill near death. And that story is told, but it's not set in a particular historical moment, right? But for me as a scholar, it was, you know, a historian, I liked figuring that uh, part of the puzzle 
But I think what is really dynamic about the tradition is that it does evolve. It's, you know, there are things that carry through from a century ago, but the dresses change. Sometimes the, the you know, ideas associated with the dress evolve. And that's something that I, I really like showing. And if you have a chance to see the Met exhibit, you can see that um, there's a black cotton velveteen dress with a beautiful beaded collar, the historic dress that we sent out there from Minnesota. The contemporary dress is just as beautiful, but the woman who makes it uses sewing machine applique to do the floral work that was once beadwork. Now we still prize beadwork and do it, but this is something that people like today. So the dress evolves, you know, the story and the tradition kind of say, stay the same, but things evolve. But I guess I would say big picture wise, what I've learned from studying the jingle dress dance is, you know, here we were a century ago with the first global pandemic in modern history. And here in the Great Lakes, we created a new healing tradition that is still deeply valued and still with us today. And I think my takeaway is we don't really know what comes out of big global you know, disasters like this one. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's something, you know, hopeful and positive. And that's what I see in the jingle dress dance tradition. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. Um, Hasia, you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah, it's a very challenging question. And one that my first reaction is somebody should write a book about that and uh, really you know, go through the uh, tremendous amount of material that we actually now have at our disposal from what happened from 2020 on as the pandemic uh, rolled over us and uh, uh, new practices, new liturgies, new texts uh, um, evolved and to actually study them and to see um, how they deviated from what had existed before and of how different uh, religious communities and communities that don't necessarily define themselves as religious actually converged around the idea of care and the idea of mutual responsibility. And, uh, but I, ha I haven't done that work, but I do want someone to, to do it. But as I was listening to your question, I was really, I did think about um, the 19, you know, the, the, the epidemic of uh, uh, the end of World War I and thinking how Jewish women might have participated in the new one, in our, uh, our uh, uh, pandemic, as opposed to in the, uh, that one of a century ago. And um, just looking at where we are right now, um, in these uh, last, uh, this last half century, women have become rabbis, they've become cantors, they've become um, a liturgists, um, they create uh, practices and texts either within the denomination, within the various Jewish denominations or independently um, in a non-denominational Jewish um, uh, context. Um, their words matter. Um, their words are heard by not only themselves, but by men. And that um, in this moment we're in, uh, women define Judaism, public Judaism, no less than men did. Okay, we think back a hundred years ago, okay, in 1919, 1920, and there was no woman rabbi. No girl had ever had a bat mitzvah. Uh, no, um, you know, one can think of one or two reform, um, you know, women in American reform who'd composed some hymns that actually made their way into prayer books. But that was a real outlier experience women's words were not uh, consumed by the larger Jewish public, that is by men. Uh, and um, if women wrote, uh, and they did, they wrote poetry, they wrote novels, they in fact wrote prayers, but it was only to be read by women and used by women. So that century has been a century of, um, you know, without being too positive and too Whiggish about it, then it has witnessed uh, a, an utter revolution in Jewish life um, in which women um, who before had no choice but to be behind the bell, up in the balcony and behind the curtain uh, and peer through to see if maybe they could see something, they now um, stormed their way uh, 
uh, uh, um, uh, onto um, the, the main stage. And so when it comes to thinking about how um, Jewish communities um, in the United States uh, responded to the pandemic, what they created, what they, uh, uh, for the, again, for self, for family, for community, and for the bigger world, um, women were there in, in, in such uh, a public and um, uh, visible and audible ways. I guess I'm not visible, but uh, visible and audible ways um, that it's almost impossible to say that women were doing something and men were doing something different. It was, they were as much defining what that public voice and public persona was. And you could not say that about either 100 years earlier or 200 years earlier, um, or indeed even 50 years earlier, uh, 60 years earlier when um, global, global Jewish people were dealing with the um, uh, repercussions of uh, what was, one might say, much bigger than the uh, uh, pandemic, but the Holocaust. And their women's voices were so small, and so marginal, and so rarely heard. And rarely did they speak for the community, communities. And by the time we get to this pandemic, it's uh, a completely different uh, uh, kind of uh, reality to think about uh, the nature of the response and how care was given and defined. Oh, I hope you, you're the one that needs to write that book you just uh -huh. talked about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a fascinating question is how has, as women have entered, um, you know, um, the, the have become rabbis have um, entered into leadership. How has that changed the understanding of what a rabbi is and what the work of care is? And anyway, I won't ask ask you to answer that whole question right now, <laughs> today, but it's a huge question. But it'd be fascinating as an area of work. Um, um, Lake Shea, um, how would you um, go about thinking about um, the global pandemic and um, and the role that women played and, uh, you know, how it, it has changed or evolving still? Um, well, overall, I would say that um, the response to the pandemic has been one of care for the community. That, you know, wearing a mask was not a big deal in Buddhist cultures or in Asian cultures in general. They're used to doing that. Whenever someone gets a cold, they wear a mask. So it wasn't a big step for them to I mean, everyone just automatically masked uh, in order to protect the community. Um, and in the areas where I've been working up in the Indian Himalayas, the response was, um, was minimal because the pandemic really did not reach up into these areas. Thankfully, they were spared. They've been pretty much spared the HIV AIDS pandemic and also the re more recent uh, COVID pandemic. Um, that being said, we have to recognize that a lot of Himalayan peoples do go into other parts of India for economic reasons. And we, our monastery was open, the nuns were under lockdown for uh, two months before finally the state government provided buses to take them back to their monasteries. The Himachali um, government made sure that the nuns were, were safely transported back to their own communities, which was important because now the number of young men becoming monks is very few, but the number of women becoming nuns is still growing. And I, I mean, I don't know how it happens, but even young girls, maybe when they see, I mean, the experience of their parents, they decide that they really want to live as a religious life and so um that may be another book but um you now we we also have to recognize that institutionally um buddhist women have been virtually excluded from buddhist institutions up to the present day um, on the higher levels there's virtually no representation of women at all in these institutions uh, this is only beginning to change in the last 30 years. Um, having been locked out of the monasteries, the monastic universities, where religious knowledge was transmitted, uh, and this has been going on since, uh, well, for centuries, 
And of course, there are big gaps in Buddhist history where we don't know exactly what was going on. Everything started out well with the Buddha recognizing the equal potential of women for, for enlightenment. But then over the centuries, we see that um, the institutions became completely male dominated. Now, in the last 30 years, as women have become more educated, we've um, been working to provide more opportunities for education. And so the voices of women are beginning to be heard. There are economic factors involved here, though, too, because the area and the ecological factors, because the Indian Himalayas are very ecologically fragile. When they're um, with global warming, the glaciers are melting. And without the glaciers, then there is no water for crops. And this means that a lot of the men leave the area to work at wage paying jobs in the Indian cities, which has many perils, you know, smoking, drinking and all of that. This leaves the women behind to do all the work, as I mentioned. Um, and that has been a mixed blessing because they have of course, had to work much harder in areas where there's virtually no health care. Uh, education is moving ahead, thanks to the central Indian government, because these areas of the Himalayas are actually located politically in India, though they're culturally Tibetan, right? So, uh, or their own unique expression of what we know as Tibetan Buddhism. So, um, the women then have taken up the responsibility of all the caregiving. Uh, both economic, they're the ones who work in the fields, they're the ones who, who harvest uh, and provide for the, the people. But it becomes harder and harder as the ecology, as the environment becomes more and more fragile, more and more um, changeable, unreliable, because they're completely reliable, reliant on the weather. Now, previously, these areas were under snow for eight months a year without any central heating, without any um, known, you know, water sources were runoff and springs, many of which have dried up, and with no road access for medicines, for health care, or for, you know, any of the staple, they have to get all of their supplies in before September to make sure that they can survive these long winters. Uh, with global warming now, of course, they can get out earlier, they can um, and they can return earlier. So that's a sort of mixed blessing as well. But um, so there are economic factors, but throughout it all, women have really been involved in preserving cultural traditions. Cultural traditions, meaning not the high religion that's done in the monasteries with the philosophy and the debate and all the, you know, the power that is concentrated in Buddhist institutions, but on the ground, women are the ones who preserve the dress. The men wear Western dress, the women all wear local dress, right? Very proudly. And it's a mark of the women that they have the pera that they inherit, the oldest daughter inherits this um, beautiful work of art made of turquoise and coral and stones. I mean, some of them this big through generations, through centuries. And they they wear this at all cultural events uh, very proudly and dance. And m many of these cultural practices are preserved thanks to the women. So there's a lot to be said about this. Oh, another thing that I'd like to mention is that in a colonial environment, as we know, India was um, colonized by the British for 200 years. People living in remote locations are often typecast as backward. Uh, and they imbibe, as women imbibe, you know, some of the stereotypes about women, negative stereotypes. Colonized peoples often in, embody, imbibe negative stereotypes of their own potential and their own qualities. And I can see that this is being overcome in recent uh, decades. And women have been a large part of this. They're, they're literally breaking through boundaries that have prescribed certain roles only for them and starting to move into areas that um, previously were unimaginable. 
and getting the highest degrees in philosophy and all of this. So this is something that I think overcoming uh, stereotypes of incapability is something very meaningful for women everywhere. There is definitely a book there in terms of this, what you've just described. I mean, wow, we are just scratching the surface here. This is also fascinating about the implications around care. And um, in, in your case, Lakshi, what does it mean that, that the number of men going into the monasteries is declining and the women are exploding in terms of numbers? That can't help but have an impact. Um, similarly with um, women becoming rabbis. I mean, immediately the, the whole dynamics within the tradition begins to change. Um, I wanted to share uh, myself. Uh, I am a Protestant minister. Um, and there's a question that's popped up um, from our audience, a great question uh, for each of these traditions we're talking about today. What roles do women play in the care of death and dying? Um, and we've sort of touched on that in, in um, uh, some way with the question of uh, responses to COVID-19 and how that was affected and lived into. Um, in my own experience, um, living in New York City, at the height of the pandemic, I became part of a um, spontaneously created um, interreligious group of of women faith leaders who met regularly and on the spot tried to create rituals to honor the, the people who had died, who were being buried, and who hadn't even been identified. Mm -hmm. So there was no family, there was no name. Um, and you know how, and and we were doing it in an interreligious context, um, and I'm I'm sure there is a book that will come out about that experience uh, from those participating in it. But that was a, a very there was no spontaneous um, group of men stepping up to mm -hmm. to in a sense pray for those who have passed. Um, but it was the women who came together to do that uh, in the context of COVID. Um, I want, I know we're getting near our, the end of our time and I, I, you, I want to give everyone a chance to, uh, say something about death and dying, but I also want to, um, move that question forward just a little bit and say that uh, the other, uh, reality that I think women and the work of care is particularly related to is the care, not just of our bodies, as humans and our collective human body, but the body that is our planet um, and mm -hmm. that we collectively face into climate catastrophe, climate crisis. Mm -hmm. So in, in each of your traditions, if you could um, say something about the, the work of care, women and responses to the climate crisis, that I think that would be very helpful and maybe um, like, like sure we haven't started with you yet. Maybe you could start off with answering that question or pondering that question, I should say. Yeah. Uh, it's a very important question. I think that, um, you know, previously women did not have the tools. They were not um, privy to the rituals of death and dying. The, a lot of these rituals were firmly in the hands of the male practitioners, whether monastics or not monastics, because when monastics were not available, sort of former monastics, and so they would, when they first started working up in these areas in the early 80s, only male practitioners would be called to perform funerals. These days, as women increasingly have access to education, literacy, basic literacy, and also to Buddhist education, they're also becoming religious specialists. And as the numbers of monks decline, they move out to other areas, then uh, it, it, we see that the villagers are actually calling the nuns to perform these rituals. And in some countries, not just in the Himalayas, I've heard them say, oh, we like the nuns, we appreciate the nuns, because they come early to the ceremonies and they leave late, which there's an implicit critique right there that, <laughs> for, um, that in 
praise of the women, they really are dedicated and serious about performing the rituals. It's not just a moneymaker for them, it's a religious practice. And so they're very much appreciated by the local communities. Now, um, as I say, the COVID um, pandemic has not reached up into these areas. My, uh, the impact has been, um, I could say minimal actually, but death happens all the time. And even if the rituals are performed by the males, the preparations are mostly in the hands of the women. Uh, and increasingly, they're taking leadership roles in these practices of preparing uh, the, not, not preparing the bodies necessarily. And that will be something interesting to track. Um, generally, that work has been left, left to the men. Uh, I think as in Judaism and Islam in particular, it's felt that women are so tender hearted that this would be too much for them emotionally. Um, we could revisit that presumption, but um, in the Buddhist tradition also, generally speaking, the hard work of death is generally shouldered by men. And let's let's watch and see what happens as we move through this in the coming years. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of education around um, HIV AIDS and also around uh, COVID and so forth is actually in the hands of the women because they're the ones who are actually teaching the children on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, we were running HIV AIDS education projects, you know, taking big screens up in the back of Jeeps and showing AIDS videos um, in the villages every evening after they returned from the fields. And after the first year, they said, um, it's okay, we got it. <laughs> in other words, if they keep the ethical precepts that Buddhism teaches, then they're not going to have a problem with HIV AIDS. So one partner at a time, thank you very much, and no problem. <laughs> so that was very interesting to watch. And um, hand washing, it's not so easy when you don't have water, So, but so far so good. Uh, I'd love to turn to Brenda on, um, and thank you for that. Um, I'd love to turn to Brenda on the question, um, taking death and dying into <laughs> planetary death and dying. And yeah. And, and indigenous knowledge and practices right. are, um, you know, I, I, along with many, happen to think that there's knowledge there that is absolutely yeah. essential. And yeah. talk about women and that in this context, please. We, Thank we you. I've been so, um, well, I, at first I, I was kind of thinking too, because it's in the forefront, I might just make a few comments about the pandemic and and kind of death and dying, and then talk more broadly about kind of environmental issues. But in our spiritual traditions here in the Great Lakes, women have always been able to participate in leadership roles, although there has been a tendency for more men to be in those positions. So it wasn't something women were really excluded from. Um, and what was interesting for me to watch, I mean, unfortunately, our situation in Indian country was much different um, from what was going in, um, in the remote areas of the Himalayas, is that we think of ourselves often as living in remote places of the United States. But when you look at the Navajo Nation and Arizona, New Mexico, right. Colorado, they were devastated by um, the, the COVID epidemic. The Mississippi Choctaw were devastated by that. And we had um, a lot of people die in our communities of COVID too, but yet it wasn't, um, it wasn't as, the, the rates weren't as higher. And I think because we kind of took um, steps early on to kind of like where I'm from at Red Light, close down the borders of the reservation uh, right away. But yet it was interesting for me and also my perch at the University of Minnesota as a professor in indigenous studies where we have these thriving language programs is to see how the, the role the younger people took uh, during the pandemic. Because in central Minnesota, our spiritual leader here in Wisconsin and Minnesota, he's well into his 70s, right? And that was what I saw with young people is that they really wanted to protect him they didn't want him going out and doing funerals as much. And so it was really heartening to see the younger people kind of assume some of those roles. 
and before I had heard some of them say, we're not going to do these um, Midday Lodge and funerals and so forth until our this person pass away. We're just apprentices to him. But they didn't want him out there in the public all the time. And so they assumed some of those roles. And it was very heartening for me to kind of see that. Um, and I always like to tell our deans in the College of Liberal Arts because you can major in Ojibwe language at the University of Minnesota. My daughter's graduating next week as an art and Ojibwe language major from the University of Minnesota. And you have to have that competence in the language in order to conduct a two day funeral in the all in the Ojibwe language, right? You have to you have to know the rituals, you have to be trained. And that's why people like to apprentice for so many years with these incredible, um, with these incredible spiritual leaders. So I saw young men and young women, some of them graduates of our program. What I was gonna say is the Dean, you know, we're not just training students for jobs, no. right? Which we often say, jobs, the economy, you know, and I think everyone should be able to get a job who graduates from college, but there also are these important cultural roles in our communities that young people can fulfill. Um, and so I have, and I always, I try not to put pressure on my daughter, especially because I'm a professor at the university where she goes to school, her choice. Um, but I, you know, I say, oh, honey, if only you could do an Ojibwe funeral, <laughs> you know, that's kind of my aspiration for, for her. So that's something that has been very, very gratifying uh, to kind of see a generational movement of younger people assuming these roles. These are not dying out. They think it's super cool to be assuming these cultural roles in our community. The language, you know, is not languishing because of the young people and their enthusiasm for it. Um, so that's something that is, you know, it makes me optimistic and hopeful for our futures because, you know, as North American Indian peoples, we had a lot of problems over the years with our religious traditions being suppressed by the mainstream and by the federal government. And that has been a tension uh, that we have lived with um, for so many years. Um, I'm also really, amazed to see the work of indigenous people around climate change issues. When I travel, I was um, in, in March, I spent um, a couple of weeks with Sami people in Northern uh, Sweden who are reindeer herders because we're working on an exhibit, an art exhibit at the University of Minnesota about Sami and Ojibwe people who live in similarly cold climates. And so it it's great, you know, I mean, it's depressing on one hand to see what's happening to reindeer herding peoples, right? Who are affected by climate change um, and other, other kinds of things. But it's really gratifying to see what their, their, their issues are. And also to feel that you're part of something larger, right? Like we, here we are, we're, you know, we're Ojibwe people of the Great Lakes, but if I go to Norway or Northern Sweden, I can find indigenous people who share my interests and my worldview about yeah. we're not the dominant mm -hmm. you know we they we have to think about the other kinds of life on the earth and so that's very gratifying yeah oh that's so beautiful to put it that way the the work of care of all of the life that's on this earth um uh Hasia, you are um we have about four minutes left so okay. let you wrap us up with your response to <laughs> This question okay. in, in, a, in a quick way. Um, okay, sorry. I'll speak even faster than I usually do. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to leave the climate uh, issue a little bit um, to the side, but I do want to echo, um, I, was, I found the image you um, offered of a female uh, clergy across denominational lines spontaneously uh, uh, banding together, creating a group, uh, creating a ritual, practicing it. Um, and it rang a bell for what I saw during the pandemic in Jewish institutions, but actually in more general, is the way in which women really were out there. And I hate to say it like this, but in greater numbers. And I would go to an immigrant rights group, be it in um, the synagogue or in something in the community, and there'd be one or two lone men sitting there. And it'd be all women 
or I was involved um, in, um, without, we, I'm, I'm sure we have political limitations on what we can say, but in uh, 2016, in um, uh, 2020, 2022, going canvassing uh, to bring about greater rights and to uh, save um, um, our progressive, what, what, what existed of a progressive society. And it would be a busload of women coming from, uh, from New York with, again, one or two men um, almost looking sheepishly uh, at this kind of um, tidal wave of uh, women volunteers um, who were fanning out all over Pennsylvania to knock on doors. And so again, I saw this at Immigrant Rights uh, Grid at the Women's March at, um, you know, it was called the Women's March because it was women who took the lead to say, this is not the kind of society we want to live in. Uh, and in a synagogue when I go, um, so I'm speaking, I guess, less as a historian and a scholar, but as a, um, uh, let's say a participant, and you go, it's mostly women who are leading the, um, the various um, uh, committees who are volunteering um, to do this, to do that, to lead um, uh, the um, uh, um, pro projects um, of care. I think uh, we began with the idea of loving kindness. So in Hebrew, it's gimilut chasadim. And you know, it's again to visit people who are sick or there has been a funeral. And like, if, the, if there is a man in, involved, it's really striking because the, the women have just seized the, the moment. Um, and um, uh, I think there's something really powerful going on because uh, this is not the picture you would have gotten a hundred years ago uh, of uh, a Gemilut Hasadim uh, committee at a synagogue. It would have been the man. And um, I think that um, in, in maybe tribute to um, second wave, um, wave feminism and perhaps um, as a comment about some other just, um, powerful changes, maybe not all good in our society, um, women have had the opportunity to um, uh, rise to the surface and care. And I think um, this is what's happening. The little, what I've seen about um, climate change issues also in the context again of the Jewish organizations that I've been involved with, it's one woman's name after another who's um, sort of sounding the alarm and saying, let's form a committee, let's do this, let's get some petitions. So um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a new age. I love that the last image we have is a busload of women going <laughs> to a march as an act of care <laughs> for our planet, for all of us, for creating the world that we seek to live in. So thank you for that image. Um, and I know we've reached our time. So um, Anna, I want to turn it back to you. Wonderful. Thank you. And yes, I, I totally agree. That's a wonderful image to, to end with. Um, and that is unfortunately all the time that we have today. Thank you so much, Serene, Brenda, Karma, and Asya for this fascinating conversation. You can view recordings from our past conference panels on our website and also sign up for our mailing list and follow us at nyhistory.org to get the latest on upcoming public programs like this one. The New York Historical Society is currently open Tuesday through Sunday. You can reserve your timed entry museum tickets on our website, and we hope to see you on Central Park soon to see our latest exhibition, Kara Walker, Harper's Pictorial History of the Civil War Annotated, on view in the Cowan Women's History Gallery through June 11th. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.